gives David the credit for the authorship. It was Psalm 139, verse 23 and, and 24. It says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Seems like an appropriate prayer as we search after God. When we moved to Kentucky, it seemed like to be kind of with the in group, you, you had to enjoy hunting. And uh, I don't know if that's necessarily an interest, but it, you know we have ladies that that shoot deer and during hunting season. And I find it interesting uh, search me, O God, and know my heart. Now sometimes heart is spelled the other way, H A R T, and it's talking about a heart in the Bible in the Old Testament, heart searching. Or the water brooks so I believe that's a good prayer and when you when we moved to Kentucky we we uh, in order for the boys to hunt they needed to go to hunters safety course and they tell you where to aim when you aim a rifle or a arrow where 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 the spot is that you want to hit on a deer or another animal, you know, you. So, when we pray this prayer, search me, O oh God, and know my heart, we're inviting him to aim, to put the bullseye, I don't know if you can see that, the crosshairs, we're inviting him to put it right here, our heart. When we pray, search me, O God, and know my heart, we're, we're inviting him to, to aim for the heart. And I, I think as we study the, the, the New Testament, that's really where he's aiming. And it's interesting to me, I have this bulletin from Rosewood when we were here on May the 7th, and it has a cross. It's a reminder of the cross of Christ, but it also looks kind of like the crosshairs, you know, like that cross. And when Jesus died on the cross, he was aiming for the heart, your heart and my heart. And when we hunt an animal, we, we're actually often, you know, we hunt for pleasure or to put meat on our table, we hunt to kill. And Jesus... When he talks about taking up the cross, he's hunting to make alive, to heal, to bring healing to the hurting, to, to make well those that are spiritually hurting, to, to make us well, to make us able to serve, make us able to, to represent his kingdom. Man's aim is so different than God's aim, but as we draw close to the heart of God, then that can be our purpose as well. So may God, uh, you know, sometimes we, we've been guilty of putting the crosshairs maybe on our brother's back. You know, we, God use this message and speak to, speak to Melvin back there this time. You know, he needs, he needs it. But really, or we're hoping that, you know, it'll make a difference with our hands, but he's making, aiming to make a difference with our heart, to our heart. And God's word is able to, to do that for us. Uh, title that I've put to the message is True Faith is Superior to Material Wealth. And I've been preaching from the book of Luke, it seems like, for a long time. And I studied Luke 18. Uh, verses 18 to 30. And in that scripture, you find an encounter 
of a man that's known as the rich young ruler, his encounter with Jesus. And so we'll read that scripture at this time, Luke 18, verse 18 to 30. And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good, save one that is God. Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother. And he said, All these have I kept from my youth up. Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, Yet lackest thou one thing, sell all that thou hast, and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. And when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they that said it, and they that heard it, said, Who then can be saved? And he said, The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Verse 28, Then Peter said, Lo, we have left all and followed thee. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house, or parents, or brethren, or wife, or children, for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive manifold more in this present time, and in the world to come, life everlasting. To me, this, the main part of this scripture is kind of a, a sad scripture. I read it in Luke. I read it in Matthew. I read it in Mark, and they basically all say the same thing. So, the question in verse 18 is a question that we see repeated sometime other places in the New Testament. Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? That's probably the most important question that we can find an answer to in our own life for everyone that's here. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? A couple of the disciples had their feet fast in stocks. We read about it in Acts. And somehow, they were men like, like we men are today. They probably had some, we know they had bruises, and it was probably a bit of a battle. You know, they were preaching, and they were beaten publicly, humiliated, put in the prison, their feet in stocks. And it seems like that God had his crosshairs on their heart. And somehow, in the middle of the night, they committed their dilemma to God, and they were singing. So if you're here this morning and, and you have a dilemma and it seems difficult, it seems like you've bruised emotionally or by life's experiences, when we turn to God, when he, when he can get to our heart, it just makes all the difference in our situation. And in the middle of their rejoicing, it seems like there was an earthquake, and they were freed, and the jailer wanted to know, what, what must I do to be saved? Out of their deep trauma came that important question, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And in this scripture reading, there was a man, you know, this is his question, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? In this life, or only in this life, not before we're here, not after we're gone, but only on those dates between the birth and the death, 
we say sometimes the dash in between on the grave marker, it's only in this life that we're going to have the opportunity to find that answer and to experience it. Not later, not before. So it is really one of the most important questions that we will face. And this is not no, new to you. You, you, you know that. Uh, it's just a reminder. Jeremiah 29, 13, And ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord. So like we said earlier, the person in this passage that was asking the question was known as the rich young ruler. And if you would read in Mark, it says that he came running. Somehow he must have learned to know that Jesus was there, and he came running and kneeled, saying, Good Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So in, in that description, we see three, three symptoms or three, yeah, I'll call them symptoms that could indicate a sincere seeking heart. A sincere seeking heart. He came running for Jesus. What, what is better for us to do? And then he kneeled. He humbled himself. And then he expressed to Jesus, good master. The I don't want to miss saying this, but maybe maybe I'm saying it too early, but the, I said it's kind of a sad chapter, a sad story, because it seemed like he turned away. But each one of us is also writing a chapter in God's record book, and each one of us will have the opportunity to come with that question. I remember years ago, it seems like, I'm not sure, was it in the evening, was it in the morning? I came with that question to my mother, and I don't know that, that it was when my life turned 180, but I, I told her and asked her in Pennsylvania Dutch, you know, I, I said, I'm, I'm not right with God, and I don't know what to do, and she, she led me to pray. And so... Uh, There is a difference of when a man or a lady is out hunting. You know, it's the, the hunted doesn't have a choice, really. I mean, they could run, but, but men are smarter, wiser, can outsmart, and they, they don't have a choice. But when God aims for your heart, when he aims for my heart, and he hits me right here where he wants to, I have a choice whether I'm going to turn toward him or I'm going to turn away from him. As diligent as this young man seemed to be, and he was taking all the right steps and he got the right answer, may your story and my story, we, we have the opportunity to choose toward him instead of away from him. And so that's that's a bright spot in this story. The end can be, can be different. When the tests come, the, the trials, we can turn our back and we can walk away, or we can turn toward him and embrace the message that he's bringing. And so maybe that's the climax of this. Our story, your story, my story doesn't have to be like this one. And we don't know what his end was. Would to God that he found a... Uh, a better way, but at least in this, the way it's recorded, you know, it, it, it could be possible that he was thinking that he could use his wealth to do a kind deed and earn his way into the kingdom. You know, maybe haul some corn to a poor community. Maybe, maybe build a children's home. You know, you... And maybe he could have improved Jesus' message going out faster but by providing a fast horse. Or, you know, it, it seems like 
what can I do? You know, he, he's identified as a wealthy person, and he, Jesus just reminded him of the Ten Commandments. He had said he kept those. And it's interesting, in Mark, it says Jesus, looking at him, loved him. And somehow, we don't understand how, but we, we take God at his word that Jesus uh, keeps an, an eye on you and I as well. And I believe Jesus would say the same thing about you and I when we come to that question. Jesus, looking at him, loved him. Looking at her, loved her. And the cross, the cross is the evidence of that. The cross. Jesus loves you, loves me, like he did this rich young ruler. And then Jesus told him, Yet lackest thou one thing. Sell all that thou hast, and distribute unto the poor. And thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. So what does Jesus see when he looks at me? What does he see when he looks at you? Would he have the same answer for you as he did for this man? What is he going to ask me to sell? What is he going to ask you to put a for sale sign on? It may not be your bank account or your house. But remember, Jesus is aiming for you, for your heart, and generally the rest of you will follow. So anything that gets in between, anything that gets in between the Lord and your heart, somehow we need to turn it loose. We need to sell it. We need to. It's a poor investment. It's something very detrimental to our well-being to the, our ability to serve him. If, if there's something in between where Jesus is aiming, then we need to be willing to just get rid of it. What does he see? Now, there is that sense where wealth, riches give, gives power to get things accomplished. It gives us the ability to have comfort, to have an easy chair in the living room, to have an air conditioner. Wealth gives power or comfort physically. The rich young ruler, when he heard Jesus' words, he was very sorrowful, for he was rich. The earmark of the genuine Christian is not something that can be bought with money. Money and possessions can help do many things, but they cannot buy you a place in God's kingdom. In fact, it can be much the other way. Where money, possessions, and pursuit of the same is our first love, woe will be to our soul when the trumpet sounds. Matthew 16, 24 then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then shall he reward every man according to his work. And so again this morning I refer back to the title, True Faith is Superior to Material Wealth. And I invite you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11. We have there, we'll notice part of the list of, of people that are mentioned as heroes of faith. And notice what brought them through. Hebrews 11, verse 24, down to 40. What brought them through when God was aiming at their heart? By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, 
esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had a respect unto the recompense of the reward. Verse 27, by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through, uh, verse 28, through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. Verse 29, by faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians, as saying to do, were drowned. Verse 30, by faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. Verse 31, by faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not, and she had when she had received the spies with peace. And what shall I say more? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets. Verse 33, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, Turned to flight the armies of the alien. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had a trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, they were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us that they without us should not be made perfect. So again, these people faced challenges. They faced persecution. They faced loneliness. They faced adverse circumstances. And by faith, when, when they turned their heart toward God, and so that's the recipe for us. When we get older and we need a walker or we need a handful of pills or other things, by faith, the inner man can be well, and we have a, a glorious hope. Uh, it's just, you know, there's many things that money can buy, but it can't always buy good health, and it can't always buy comfort. But faith in God and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, it can bring us to rest. Those that were tortured, those that lost their lives, perhaps had no rest here. But when they passed over from time into eternity, they passed over into rest. So may we embrace faith in the Lord Jesus this morning. In verse 26, it says about Moses, For he had respect under the recompense of reward. If Moses would have had an eye just to time and to now, it would have been a foolish choice for him to turn his back on Egypt. Egypt was powerful. They, had, they knew how to do military. But Moses looked to eternity. He was looking, it says early in this chapter, for a city whose builder and maker is God. And so that is an example for us. Make our choices based on eternity. In the last verses, it's not just for eternity. Jesus reminds the disciples, Luke 18, verse 29 and 30, And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house, or parents, or brethren, or wife, or children, for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive manifold more in this present time, and in the world to come, life everlasting. It's just a win-win situation when we turn, when God hits the crosshairs and we respond to him 
instead of turning away from him. It is faith, not material wealth, that promises us comfort in the new heaven and the new earth. Hebrews 11, verse 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11, 6, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Paul's testimony to the Philippians, Yet, yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the, of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. This is a, a growing experience, something we follow after. We're not there yet, but we, we keep on turning toward him. We keep turning toward him. I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. See, God is not finished with us yet he's here and if our goals have gotten out on the left somewhere God's going to let us know he's going to bring us brethren be ye followers together of me and mark them which walk as ye of us for an example and sample is is Paul's testimony it is possible to make other choices for many walk of whom I've told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, whose mind, who mind earthly things. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. God can take our struggle with temptation with the flesh and he can give us victory when we turn to him. Victory is something that we can grow in in our life here. We don't need to be defeated on a day-to-day -day basis. We can acknowledge our sin and you know, 1 John 1, 9, it tells us if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He makes an opportunity, a way for us. God always has a way for us. The way may seem difficult, but he always has an answer. It doesn't always come right away. We need to have patience, but he always has a way for us. Jesus said of the rich young ruler, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God. If I'm depending on what's in my wallet, my credit card, my bank account, to get me through, y'all are old enough you know that it doesn't get it. It doesn't get it. We need more than that. How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel. I borrowed a camel from Sue to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Among some of the things that my mother left behind was this big needle. And it has a, an eye, a needle's eye. And I'm not sure about the posture of this camel. He's got his head kind of turned up. I'm not sure what that means. And he's probably, maybe he's a two-ounce camel, but he's standing in. Jesus was probably talking about a, you know, like a, 
maybe 2,000 pound camel, I'm not sure. But it doesn't really make much difference. If we're going to try to, Jesus said, what did he say? Uh, it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of, heaven, of God. So even this little camel, it, you know, it just, it just doesn't fit. And some have said that Jesus may have been referring to a place in the wall where the camels had to be unloaded to make it through. I'm not sure. Does anyone know for sure in our time what Jesus actually did mean? But it's very clear In this case, it seemed like his heart was set on going on with his material projects. And it's very clear that it, Jesus just, it wasn't going to work. How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God, for it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Most of us here this morning, many of us have a, a little bowl or a jar or something with change in it that we hardly pay attention to. We just add a little bit to it. And we, we're living in a land of plenty, and most of us have plenty. There may be those times when a $20 bill is very valuable to us, has been in the past, but we're probably wealthier than most people. We, we don't get exposed a lot to people that are just living from day to day, and they would love to find the dime or the nickel or the quarter in the change pile that we just kind of don't pay attention to. So God is calling us this morning to sell out that for sale sign that it held up. He's calling us, if there's something between us, our heart, and just a full surrender to him, he's, he's wanting us, he's telling us in this story to just get rid of it, get rid of it. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Later in Matthew 6, verse 24, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And at the end of the chapter, those encouraging verses, verse 31, 32, and 33, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink? Wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So we just said that probably all of us here are wealthier than most of the world's population. How are we going to how are we going to work this out? It looks like an impossible thing. But you know Jesus said the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Jesus assures us that it can be practical in your life and in my life. But how? Zechariah 4, verse 6, Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. We're not going to get a halter on the camel and pull him through. It's it just not, we're not going to have a strong enough rope to pull him through. Not by might, nor by power, but my spirit, by my spirit. Jesus said to the Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4, But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up unto everlasting, into everlasting life. 
verse 23, later in John chapter 4, Jesus is still speaking to the Samaritan woman, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. In John chapter 3, when Jesus met Nicodemus, or Nicodemus met Jesus by night, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. As long as the rich young ruler saw his wealth as the most important thing that he had and that it needed to be tended to. He wasn't going to make it through to the kingdom of God. He was so close, so close. He came running, he kneeled, but then he turned away. You and I don't need to turn away. We can turn toward. First John 1, verse 5. This then is the message which we have Heard of him and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Sometimes rather than giving ourselves, we kind of like to just give our stuff. You know, we just, we're going to serve God with our stuff. And you know what? We can serve God with our stuff. He gave the rich young ruler the remedy. Sell what you have and give. We can build treasures in heaven on our account when we use the things that God has trusted to us. We can build treasures in heaven with that. We can't buy our way into heaven with that. But we can minister. The needle can become stitches of compassion. It can be used for healing, for binding up the brokenhearted. It can be a sign of, not of the impossible eye, but of compassion to our neighbor, to our son, to our daughter, to our spouse, to where the needs are. There was no bargain when Jesus went to the cross. When he faced the crosshairs, the cross, he gave everything that he had. There was, it, wasn't, it wasn't a bargain. And he's asking us, you, and your situation, mine, my situation. He's not asking for anything less. When he aims at your heart, my heart, he wants it. He wants it completely. When we give it to him completely, we can have joy in the middle of our difficult situations, circumstances. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, Ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, 
might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom ye having not seen, ye love, in whom though ye see Though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy, unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. God has a plan for your life. He has a plan for mine. His heart is that when he sends me through trials to turn my heart toward him, your story and my story don't need to be like the rich young ruler that came with his energy and then when God hit him right where it counted, he turned away. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Let's uh, kneel for prayer this time.